Hey guys, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who pledged to our Patreon page. You are really helpful to the show and we are grateful for your help. Just in case you're wondering, Patreon is a simple way for you to contribute to the podcast and get super cool exclusive rewards in return. I promise you will love the perks. Our Patreon page is at frederickby.com. That's Frederick with a C, by like bye-bye.com. And click the Patreon in the header. The money is used to cover our production costs and enhancements. It is also used to cover our editing time and sharing to the different podcast channels. You can contribute for as low as $1. So go now, frederickby.com and click Patreon in the header. Until then, have a great episode. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am excited. I am Frederick Bai, and I am the host of Creative Magic Unchained and founder of the Creative Magic Network, available at frederickbai.com. Frederick with a C, bye like bye bye.com. And this is a new show that will air every single Thursday with a man I respect and whose work I admire. Talk to him, Max. Well, hello, Frederick. I appreciate the great build up there. My name is Maxwell Ivy. Some of you know me as Max. I'm internationally known as the Blind Blogger. And I'm very happy to be uh, doing a show again and to, to be doing it with such a, a great guy, a fellow that I've been on, on air with several times and who I also respect a lot. And for those of y'all who don't don't know me, I'm one of these people. I have uh, changed my life uh, quite, quite a bit through... Some of it was forced on me by circumstances. Some of it was just my natural curiosity and wanting to, to do more with my life than, than what I was doing at that time. Uh, I started off a carny, uh, went to become an amusement equipment broker. That led to being a, an author, a life coach, a speaker, and now I'm an online media publicist helping people get themselves on radio, podcasts, and other online media so they can share their stories and promote their products and services. So. A lot of stuff along the way, and that's probably the quickest I've ever broken it down for, for any show I've ever been on. So <laughs> you ought to be honored, Fred. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are going to do this show every Thursday, and the goal of the show is to get people moving, to get you to take some small action every day, because at the end of these shows, I want you to ask yourself, if Max can do it, if Michael can do it, if Fred can do it, then what is my excuse? And today we have a very special guy with us, our f first guest, and I wanted somebody compelling, and uh, the God in the universe brought me somebody that was even better than, than what I was hoping for. Uh, his name is Michael Schwartz. He's a 20-year veteran of uh, journalism and film production. He has uh, traveled the world or is in the process of traveling the world. He is... Uh, losing his vision, and as he likes to say, he may be uh, losing his sight, but he's not losing his vision because he doesn't allow it to keep him from doing what he loves, which is telling stories through a visual medium, whether that be photography or uh, films or videos. Um, he is currently working on a, on a project that he calls the Pallet Project, where he is traveling around the world spotlighting people who are visually impaired and showing the rest of us uh, just how much people are capable of. Uh, it's I've listened to a few of his videos, and I've been impressed with some of the people he has come in contact with on his journey. And to me, that's the best part about doing something like this is the people you meet along the way. So without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Michael to the show. Uh, thank you for coming on with us. How are you doing today, Michael? Max, I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for inviting me, and hey, congratulations on the first show. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, the, the best thing about a first show is you know that next week you'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> you start off good, and you get better from there. That's the truth, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, and you know, I I don't I don't know how much time we're going to have today, but I know generally these things go by way too quick, and so I want to get right into it here. Tell people what the uh, 
tell people better than what I did. What the pellet project is, why the why you're using the the approach of of colors, especially for somebody who's losing his vision. Because I get asked all the time, Max, why do you use the word see saw and watch so often? So why don't you start by telling people about the project and and a little bit about the behind as far as where it started from. Sure thing, Max, and you, you are so right. Uh, we visually impaired folk get asked that question so many times. Is it okay to use the word see? Can I say, did you take a look at? And you're always having to explain, yes, it's okay. It's not a forbidden word. Uh, look is not a four-letter word. I use it too. So it, it, talking about the palette project and my mission in creating this documentary and series – I really wanted to tackle that head on because there, there's just a truth behind what I'm doing with this project that the world in all of its excitement and all of the stories that are out there, it exists just through and beyond this rich vibrancy of color and color means so many things. When I first embarked on this project my idea was, well, let's explore this amazing world that we live in, and let's do it one color at a time and use that as the theme for this journey. I started off in the red center of Australia, met some amazing people in the outback, moved on from there to the uh, the blue waters of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of New Zealand and I can tell you more about this. Um, If you like, it's an amazing story. Um, Sailed with a crew of blind sailors off the coast of Auckland in New Zealand and then went down to the Cook Strait. That's the channel of water that separates the North and South Islands and hung out and followed a fleet of four disabled sailors as they sailed solo across the strait. And this is one of the most dangerous bodies of water in the world. I even had my doubts whether or not this was a good idea, but they showed me a thing or two about what they could do. <laughs> it was it was unbelievable. And yeah, we're moving on from there. Well, you know, it's good that you pro- that you mentioned that because um, one of the things that so often gets in people's way as far as telling their story is they think their story isn't big enough. And I've even been guilty of this myself. I- I, I've read the biographies of people like Wyman Mirror and Rothschilds and Skidoris, and I've been listening to your videos, and I'm like, man, what right do I have to be saying that I'm anything special, that people should emulate me? And the thing, that's, But the thing is, is everybody has a story, and it's only through us each telling our own individual story in, in our own individual voice that uh, that this world can be the kind of place it's meant to be. So I've, I've, I appreciate that you mentioned that, you know, you've, it really impressed by some of these other people and they were doing some things that even you thought maybe were not such a good idea. I think it's an important point to make. You just put it correctly, Max. Um, there's a journalist I've admired for most of my career. His name is Steve Hartman. And he used to do a series for CBS news called everybody has a story. And I think that's something that everybody can keep in mind without being too, involved or self-involved with that idea what what that phrase is really saying is that never deny yourself your own self-worth you are important you matter so what's your story and the world is just filled with so many stories i'll never run out i could stay on the road forever in any city any part of the world and i don't think i would have any problem finding people who have interesting stories to tell, no doubt. Yeah. And that, that brings me to a question that I wanted to ask you because it's something that I firmly believe in. And my dad used to tell me that a one man band doesn't play too loudly for too long. So I don't imagine that you do this stuff by yourself. So I'm wondering what, what, what who were some of the people who got you started on the idea of this, uh, this big, big idea of, traveling around the world and doing the documentary you are asking all the right questions today max this is a great first show because we're hitting on so many points that are so important let me tell you how the palette project 
started. I've had this issue, I guess you could call it, of just degenerative vision loss for most of my life. It started when I was 13 years old. And like most people who don't quite know what to do when this process starts, you try to do what's called pass. You try to hide it. You try to figure out what can I do that I can just live my life and just compartmentalize this. That's not always a good idea. Now, you do follow your dreams and you follow your passions, but you have to be who you are. And this has been a seesaw over the course of my life, or at least it was until, oh, really about two years ago. And that's when my eyesight just dropped off a cliff. It just went from not good to bad to worse to just very bad, and you just couldn't deny the truth of the progression or the regression of this situation. And I found myself two years ago having to make some very major changes just from the way I got around to the way you use a computer, let alone the way you can maintain this business of being a visual storyteller who's visually impaired. It's not something that tends to work pretty well. And I found myself speaking with a very good friend of mine, a friend of mine who himself has probably been through the ringer when it comes to issues in his own life, but who has also just made a success out of his circumstances. And he said, you know, your next project should really be yourself. And I fought that, Max. I fought it tooth and nail because <laughs> – look, exactly. You know, when you're a journalist, and that's my training, there's a motto or just a credo you try to live by. Be the storyteller, not the story. And – I still believe that. And when he said, you should do a story about yourself and what's happening. And I said, well, what's happening to me is not that interesting in the vast scheme of things. And he said, Mike, Michael, <laughs> stop for just a moment. <laughs> and he said, do you know any other visually impaired filmmakers? And I said, well, not off the top of my head. And he said, probably not off the bottom of your head either. <laughs> and so life is about compromise. And I knew what I wanted to do next. So the compromise I made was very much, all right, I will grant you that there is probably an interesting story that gets this larger story started. So let me explain where I'm coming from and how that infuses and how that informs what I'm doing for a living and what I feel like. I'm here to do, you know, there's, there's just, and I think a lot of people who are listening to this can sympathize with this. There are so many people who spend so much time planning their lives one step ahead and trying to figure out what their calling is when they probably already know. And my calling happens to be that I'm a storyteller, but I hope that if you, and I'm speaking to you on the other end of this podcast, listening to this, if you're wondering what your calling is, you may already know. Just take a second and think what drives you, what makes you feel passionate. And not only is that your calling, that's your story. So, you know, go ahead, live it. Why, why, do, you yeah. think, why, why do you think we, are, we, we don't live our calling? You know what I mean? Like, why do you think... As you say, deep down, we can we kind of know what it is. Things that we're running from it a little bit because it's the same thing you're talking about. It's the same thing that happened with me too. It's like I kind of knew it, but I didn't do it. And then it's like I kind of throw my hands. I threw my hands in the air. It's like I know what I am. Like I don't need to. Like why am I running from it? You know why? Why do we run from it? <laughs> that's that, that's a really good observation and. You know, it puts me in mind of the famous John Lennon quote, you know, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And we let ourselves – and I'm victim – I fall victim to this as much as the next person. There's so much to do just every day just to tread water. That's the first thing. We are doing so many things. We're trying to pay the mortgage or we're trying to buy the groceries 
or we're trying to get the next job down the line, or we're taking care of the kids. And these are all important things. Where do the where do your passions come from and can they be incorporated into what you do every day? You know, we all know the John Grisham, the author of today, the one who could some people say just rewrite the phone book and write a bestseller. But <laughs> we forget about the John Grisham who was sitting in his home office in Mississippi and had his own problems to deal with and his own day-to-day issues that are just what we've been talking about, just getting by and found a half hour a day to write A Time to Kill and couldn't find an agent, couldn't find a publisher, said, I'm going to self-publish. And this was in a time where there was no medium.com. There was no Kindle. There were no eBooks. Self-publishing was what you did when you just had a vanity project. But he said, this needs to be in print. It needs to be words on a page. So he carved out what little time he had in the midst of his own very busy life. And thankfully, he was successful. He saw his dreams realized. Um, He marketed his own book. He uh, He got it stocked in bookstores. Um, around Mississippi. Um, by the way, um, bookstores are those things where they actually used to have physical copies of these things called books. Um, you know, back you know when I used to ride my dinosaur to school. So if anybody's listening and wondering about that, um, bookstores were these great places where you could actually buy books, where you didn't actually have to go online to uh, to do this. But I think of people like him, and think of how many hours there are in a day. And are there any hours you're not using? And in the midst of your plans, can you plan one extra thing? And most of us can do that. Most of us can plan for one extra thing. And if that's your dream, that's an excellent start. Yeah, which is which is why I always tell people if they want to get to that big dream or big goal, they need to find one concrete action they can take today and then do that again tomorrow. That's 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 my thing. Uh, but I, I've also noticed that for a lot of people, it's not it's not necessarily doing it. It can be what it's called when they do it. Because I know that for me, a lot of the stuff that I do that I do as part of my business now is not stuff that I would have said, "Okay, I'm an author," or "Okay, I'm a, a speaker," or, "Okay, I'm an, a, a, an online publicist." I would say that. I'm helping people sell amusement equipment as opposed to calling myself a broker. Um, and I wonder if sometimes people don't also prevent themselves from doing things because it means having to call themselves a painter or a filmmaker or an author. That's interesting. Wow. I think you might be onto something there. Um, yeah. This is, this is one of the hardest things we do, you know, because it's so easy it's so easy to define ourselves by our jobs, and we all fall victim to this. I was a reporter for just about 12 years or so, a news reporter, and that's how I define myself. You know, if you it, – it, it's, it's interesting because one way I've thought about it is what happens if you're sound asleep and all of a sudden somebody shakes you awake, you're confused, you're disoriented, and – the question they ask is, quick, what are you? What you answer like right then? <laughs> what, do, what, do, what do you do? It's always that's, that question exactly. we get asked. That's, that's who you are. And when I wasn't a reporter anymore, that's a strange place to be in because that's oh, yeah. how I define myself. I know that. But, place. yeah. But you know what I really am? I'm a storyteller. And I don't see myself ever being in any position where that's not the umbrella. That's that's what, what that's what does it for me. That's what gets me up in the morning. So, you know, I'm curious, Max. You know, in, in your different jobs, what are you? What 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 do you have? Have you figured out whether you're you say you're a painter or an artist or a salesperson? Do you know what what you are? I would say at my core, I'm somebody who enjoys helping other people, 
and that's why I tend to be all over the map and why when people, when business coaches tell me I should pick one thing and focus on it, I'm like, are you, are you crazy? How would I do that? Who would I, yeah. Yeah. who would I stop? Who would I stop helping tomorrow in order to get quote focused or quote serious and, and just focus on one thing? Because like, for example, earlier this year, I helped a woman in California sell a, a train and because of that sale, her and her husband can now finalize their divorce and get out of a, a very negative emotional situation. You know, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Uh, people like you who are creative people but who don't have the time or don't have the experience to market themselves online. You know, what, I stop helping those people? Uh, the people who have a dream but need somebody to motivate them and to hold them accountable so they can take steps and actually actually do something instead of just continuing to shred water, if you, as you put it, you know. How do I stop helping those people? So at my at my core, uh, I'm I'm into serving others and helping other people uh, accomplish what they need to in their lives. And I get a, a immense pleasure out of helping people. And the more they needed my help at the time, the better I like it. And doesn't that answer so many questions for you? Doesn't that already take so much time off the table during your day? You already know what you're supposed to do let's 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 spread it out a little bit and see how that works across the board you know how many people do we know who are envisioning a career change for themselves and if you take out of that pool the people who are changing careers for something for an unaccounted for reason they they have to do what they need to do to feed their family for example and these are circumstances that are unusual, but you, sometimes you do. You do have to do what you have to do to get by and to, you know, to just live the life that you that you need to live as far as your responsibilities as an adult. Um, let's let's take that let's take that pool and put it aside for just a moment. How many people are thinking it's time for a career change, and they say, well. I don't know if I want to be A. I think I want to be B. I'm telling you, chances are probably there is a common denominator between where you're moving from to where you're moving to or where you want to move to that hits at that core. Otherwise, why would you do it? And why would you have done the first thing in the first place? It's so much simpler to identify, to take the time to identify within yourself what that core is. You mentioned being a painter, being a sculptor, being any kind of an artist. Isn't it really being a creator? Isn't it really being that um, umbrella person rather than being a specific kind of person? Because if what drives you is the idea of molding something, of creating something out of nothing, you don't have to be a painter. You might have the painting skills today, Maybe you'll have the sculpting skills tomorrow, and you'll take your 10,000 hours and become a sculptor. Maybe you'll become a writer. If what really drives you is the umbrella, then it'll all come together. It has for me. I don't see why it wouldn't for anybody else. I I just finished reading an incredible book by Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic, and my friends are already starting to get tired of hearing me talk about this book. (laughs) Um, Man, I got to read it. I got to freaking read that book. Oh, geez. it It is all about the creative process, and she is definitely in tune with what you were just saying about, um, and her, her biggest thing is curiosity over passion, because she believes that a lot of creative people decide that they're an art they're a painter or a uh, or a writer or a singer or a songwriter and they limit their natural curiosity and she says there are days when passion won't get you out of bed but curiosity will oh, <laughs> yeah, yes you reminded me of that uh the movie uh music and lyrics with uh hugh grant and, and i think it's drew barrymore and There's this line in that movie where he says something that sounds so cynical, um, but it should be incorporated into what we do when he talks about – he says, inspiration is for amateurs. And the movie almost looks at that like it's a bad thing. However, 
put that together with this idea that passion gets you gets you revved up. But what do you, you do when you wake up in the morning and the coffee doesn't really taste so good, or you know you just uh, you know you twisted when you should have turned when you slept overnight, and you, you, you're just or you know the traffic on the 101 was bad, and you, you're just not feeling it right then. You know, writers call this blank page syndrome. What do you rely on when passion's just not there? And you rely, frankly, on a reservoir of passion that you've built up over the years of doing what you love. I mean, I can tell you, I was in Australia for two weeks when this documentary started. And here we are in this phenomenal part of the world. I mean, we're, we're in the outback, and it, it's it's gorgeous i mean you're feeling that you're feeling the dust just flatten the air on your face to say that it's a dry heat just really doesn't do justice to the term dry heat we're tromping through desert scrub and we're running into these little creatures that you know scientists are still discovering they thought they've been extinct for millions of years and they're still finding them and we're going to these watering holes and the list goes on and on and yet you wake up in the middle one day and it's like oh my goodness not another day of shooting in the outback when this is going to be over (laughs) 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 because you know there are days when what you love to do is just another job and you can it's your passion for just what gets you up in the morning most days that gets you through you know if i if i can share one one other little tidbit when i was uh reporting i was working in uh memphis um with a news director i really admired still keep in touch with to this day and he said you know what the ratio is for what you do um and i'd already been in the game for 10 years i thought yeah, there wasn't much more that I could learn about that part. He says, one for five, that's your ratio. He said, if you can go home at the end of the week or at the end of the month and say one out of every five reporting was a good day. I liked what I did. It really turned out exactly how I wanted. I was firing on all cylinders. Then guess what? You are a success. And I got real down about that. And he said, success is built on how you handle failure. You know, it's just it's just like playing baseball. You know, if you can if you can hit 300, that means you fail 70 percent of the time, but you're still considered one of the greatest players in the game. So, you know, learn how to incorporate both. All right. Right before continuing this conversation for you, the listeners of the podcast, Audible is offering a free audio download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I personally recommend The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, a classic. You can choose the audiobook of your choice right now for free by trying Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Fred. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Fred for your free audiobook. All right, once again, we're here with Michael Schwartz. He's an award-winning reporter with more than 20 years' experience in television, news, and production. He's the founder of Trailhead Reductions, a video production house that focuses on serving nonprofits, NGOs, and specialists in health and wellness. Take it away, Max. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with the listeners. One of the reasons why I wanted to book you is because I'm fixing to start out on my own little adventure compared to yours. Uh, but thankfully I'm not into comparing. So that isn't, that is a, that is a the thing. Um, I would like you to share some of the ways that you managed to record these, uh, videos that you managed to, 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 uh, to do your, your film storytelling as a blind person. I didn't want to make this episode all about, uh, being blind or visually impaired, but, uh, I have you here. If I didn't at least pick your brain a little bit, I'd kick myself later. Sure, no problem, Max. And a- as you know, there's still um, there's still a little bit of oil left in the can. I can still see a little bit, not a lot. Um, you know, I think if you had to put a percentage on it, it would probably be around ten percent of what a fully sighted person sees. Um, that's not a lot. If I walked out the door without that uh, long white cane, it would be a very bad day, um, and it would be. <laughs> 
it would be very obvious that something's up. Um, so my days of being lead dog, of being chief photographer, those days are mostly in my rearview mirror. But let's talk about what we do and what I do to you know take the pictures that I do take and how, more importantly, I work with a team to craft this creative vision this is something i brought up last uh, last time i did a, uh, a ted talk about being a visual storyteller who is visually impaired and the point of it was is that if all i do is talk about the how of what i do the mechanics then all i've done is really just introduce you to the novelty of one of the only visually impaired filmmakers you are ever likely to meet. So there are things that I can and should talk about when it comes to those mechanics, you know, how you use the the acoustic dimensions of an environment or a set to frame a shot. Um, And this is something you become frankly more skilled at the more visually impaired you get or how I shoot twice as many shots at four times the resolution to make sure that what I want is in that frame. And for those of us here who can speak technically about shooting video, we're talking about shooting today in a 4K resolution to edit on a 1080 or 720 timeline. And this is this is all information that is easily explained online about how this works in editing. But the idea basically is work twice as hard to get half as much. Um, or if I don't even think of color so much as I think of color temperature and waveforms and vector scopes to craft the design and the mood of a shot when we get back to post-production – those are, those are the mechanics of what I do to make sure that it looks good once it gets to the final stage. Right. But well, I just I, – yeah. Here's, I'll, here's, I'll, I'll, yeah. Mm-hmm. here's what I want. I want. I want one, for instance, of something that you have come up with, a technique that you have developed that has allowed you to solve a problem that uh, that a, a sighted filmmaker might not have to deal with but – See, the point of the show is I believe that that people often make excuses instead of finding solutions. So sure. in addition to hearing your story, I feel like it's good if you can give them at least one concrete example of just a guy who was, okay, I know that there's a way I can do this. If I just think about it or ask enough people, I can find that way. So sure. if you could give me one example of something like that in your in your daily or work life, I would really appreciate it. Sure. So let's start with the idea of listening for the shot. Now, this doesn't work for every shot. You know, it's hard to take a shot where you're listening to the Grand Canyon, although you can. And it, the Grand Canyon definitely does have its own sound. But let's say you're listening for the shot of the sailor raising the sail. And you are a visually impaired person and you are shooting that. I go back to what I was talking about just a moment ago. I'm shooting on a wide canvas, much wider than I need. So right now I can afford to shoot on 4K because most people don't watch 4K video. That is a very high-resolution shot. Um, They're watching on high def, regular high def, which is a 1080 shot. Now what that means is you are shooting more pixels than you need. Um, it's almost imagine your hand, and that's the frame of the shot, but the only part of the shot that would show up if you just laid that shot on top of your editing timeline would be like the middle part of your palm. That affords people like you and me a great opportunity because we have a shot that's so big we can move it around on the editing frame once we import that larger Uh, that larger pixel resolution frame onto the 1080 frame that even though, Hey, you can't see exactly what you're shooting. You got most of it or, or you got all of it and it's in there in what you shot. Now you just have to manipulate it in post-production. So it looks good. Now you may be working with an editor. 
Um, you may be working, depending on your level of vision, you may be working just by yourself. But the shot's there, and that's what matters. So, yeah, that's something you can do. Shoot shoot a bigger picture than you need and fix it in post. I um, I still have my uh, favorite T-shirt with the uh, upside-down pocket in the front, an upside-down pocket. And on the pocket, it says, we'll fix it in post. Um, <laughs> so, you know, learn to live, learn to live with that. That's, that's something you can do. Um, other people will give you advice like shoot autofocus. Um, that works sometimes, but that's a, that's an arrow you can have in your quiver. Um, I would say, you know, don't discount this magnificent thing called a GoPro. You know, it does when, when you use it in its lane, it shoots some pretty good pictures. Um, when we were, uh, shooting on that sailboat, um, off the coast of Auckland, my cinematographer and I, we had equal duties. He was shooting on my HD cam at one end of the boat, and I was shooting on this little tiny GoPro on the other end of the boat. And I used the heck out of that thing. And I'm very proud of the fact that um, once we did color correction um, to make sure that the color temperatures uh, matched camera for camera, nobody could tell who was shooting what. You know, no, nobody knew who the visually impaired photog was and who was the guy that's worked on feature films. <laughs> so Now, that's what I'm talking about. That's, I'm counting. That, yeah. that, <laughs> Scoreboard. That's, that's a no-excuses moment there, you know, that they that people watching that footage would not be able to tell the blind guy's work from the sighted guy's work. Now, that's, that's cool. That's really awesome. I was happy about it. <laughs> hey, uh, how do you deal – tell us a little bit about um... – you know, the feelings and what went on into your consciousness when, when, okay, hey, I'm losing my vision, you know, I can't be a reporter anymore or maybe chose not to be a reporter. But, you know, tell us what was going on in your transition because a lot of people who are listening to this might be seeing and a lot of them might be in that transition right now. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, what? you're right. It's, it's, it's a big change and – really more of us are going through it. We have an aging population that works longer. So, you know, we don't have to go too far back in time to look at a time when most people who experienced vision loss were doing it at a point where their careers were naturally ending anyway. But not only do you have that component, you have people like me and a significant part of the visually impaired population who have been dealing with this for a very long time, people who have diseases like retinitis pigmentosus um, or diabetic retinopathy or any number of other eye diseases where they're facing the loss of their vision over the course of many years. So it's this tick, 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 tick that just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And it's not – I want to make sure that I'm not pigeon, pigeonholing myself into just this area of vision loss because I don't want you, dear listener, listening to this thinking, well, my problems don't match up to that or my problems are worse than this or I have something that's completely different. Let's look at the common ground here. You're dealing with a major life change and it affects your daily ability to do things you used to know well. It's I'm not going to say that it's not depressing and that it doesn't knock you flat because it does. And you'd have to have something seriously wrong with you for it not to affect you in a very serious way. I mean, imagine walking a street you've walked every day of your life or have previously driven every day of your life. And all of a sudden, this route that you thought you knew well is a very confusing place. It's filled with shadows and weird lights and strange curves that you never noticed before. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my goodness. Um, I, used to, uh, I used to drive these six-day nonstop road trips, and now getting to the coffee shop near my house is a major challenge. What do you do? Well, what you do is you find the people who have – been on this route before. And I don't mean this literal route. I, I mean, have traveled this metaphorical road. There is this huge network 
and infrastructure of people and places who have already figured out most of the problems you're having now. So the mechanics of what you need to learn how to do, everything from orientation and mobility to reading your email to paying your bills to shopping for groceries and everything else that gets you through the day-to-day, these are the questions you can take comfort in the fact have already been figured out for you. So all you have to do is find those people, and they are there. But I think what you're getting at is how do you pick yourself up when you have been so knocked flat? Mm -hmm. And what it is is going back to this idea of – and this has to be your mantra. I'm still me. I'm still me. I'm still me. Hmm. Hopefully you've had a good idea of who you are as a human being on God's earth. Before this started, that's going to be a huge part of what happens next. You know, I, I've said it in in this podcast that what I am is a storyteller. You know, tell me there's a bone in the yard. I'll dig it up, and I might not be doing it the same way anymore, but that has to be still what I'm about. It's a matter of knowing yourself. It's a matter of your friends knowing you, your family knowing you, and having that mutual freeway of ideas where people believe in you as much as you believe in them. I was and am, Fred and Max, I'm still so blessed that I have always had a family where the word no, that, that doesn't really exist. There's, there's a way. And there's nothing different about me today than there was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. It doesn't matter. So that's the basics of what got me off my feet and kept me going. Wow. I love that. I love that. We got a few minutes left. We got around uh, five, six minutes left. Go ahead, Max. Got something to say? Okay. I just, I just want to say that the one thing that most people, uh, who are, who are still trying to come to terms with that transformation because, because change is change is they haven't gotten to the point where they're willing to ask other people for help or for ask ask other people for that information so that's that's the key thing most people have to get to that point where they're willing to look a little foolish if that's what it takes in order to get the information they need to to to, to be that person they've always been again Max, you what yes yes and can I, can I say something Something quick about that um, because well, it's going to have to be re- it's going to have to be real quick because that was Frederick telling me we got about five minutes left. So I don't <laughs> run. Right. Yeah. No, no, be willing. Okay, okay, then the then, then, <laughs> then then the quick version is be willing to look foolish. You know, when I started using a cane, I was so embarrassed. I thought people are going to be looking at me and they're going to see me hitting telephone poles and everything else. And one of my best friends said, first of all, how are you going to learn? Second of all. They have too much on their mind. Five true. seconds after you pass, it's out of their yeah. lives completely, and that's true. So true. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry about looking foolish. People have their own issues. Deal with your own. So. Okay. Well, I've really enjoyed having you. This is uh, Michael. I, Michael I have Schwartz. One more question. No, we have a little bit more time. I have one. More oh, okay. Question. All right. Cool. <laughs> how do you remain? How do you remain calm in uncertainty? You're not. You're kind of a. An entrepreneur, you know, you're you're kind of you're an artist, you're a storyteller, as you say. But you know, you go out there and you do the move, the the um, you know the video production thing. And how do you remain calm in uncertainty? Because now you know uncertainty. The reporter, you know, you get a paycheck every single day or whatever. I don't know how it works, but I I assume that's how it works. But you know, how do you remain calm in uncertainty? What's your um? I, I use some of the same techniques, frankly, that I used when I was a reporter. What always got me through, guys, was when the world speeds up, I slow down. The world's not going to end even in the middle of a crisis just because you take 10 seconds to take a deep breath, wow, that... get yourself composed, and figure it out. Oh, I love and, that. Wait, wait, yeah. Repeat that. You said when the world goes fast, I slow down. That's what you said? Exactly. Exactly. When the world speeds up, I slow down. And wow. that has never steered me wrong, whether as a business owner or working, you know, 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week, whatever it is. You know, there is very little I can think of that does not get better by just taking a moment to get yourself composed and figure out, you know, what to do in the midst of chaos. 
it helps. Wow, that, that's a, that, that's good. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that when the world speeds up. You mean when you when you say you 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 slow down, you mean you calm down, right? So, exactly. Yeah. It, there's listen when when everything is rushing around you, and you can even think about this in a literal sense. When everybody is running, if you're the person standing still, aren't you the one that people are looking at? So oh, they're, they're like, good. why is why is he not running? <laughs> so mm. the reason so. It, uh, it, it has not steered me wrong yet. Um, you know, it hasn't steered me wrong with, with being a reporter and it hasn't steered me wrong with the pallet project. And I hope, uh, you know, as we talk about, you know, how people can see the results of this and how they can get involved with this project. Um, I hope that's something that they can keep in mind also. And that's, that's why I didn't want to, I didn't want to run out of time here because I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell people uh, how they can find you and support you in your mission and any uh, places where you want them to connect with you online. That is so kind of you, Max. I, I, I really appreciate that. So I want to give a, a web address because this film and series is still going on. And in line with the idea that you can only get help if you ask for it, I'm asking for help. This is a story where we're meeting amazing people from all over, the, all over the world, visually impaired men and women and children who are changing perceptions, and they're raising expectations, and they're making a difference in their own lives and the lives of everyone around them. These are great stories. They're not downer stories, by the way. These are like fun, entertaining, and informative stories that you're going to love to watch. So I want to give you this web address. Um, and I'm even going to say, you know, if, if you got a pen nearby, write it down, put it or type it down because it's a little bit of an unusual spelling. So I've given you fair warning. I would like you please to be a backer on my Patreon page. I'm taking contributions in micro payment amounts because I want a large audience. I'm not really looking for the million dollar investor. I'm looking for a community and I want people to join this journey as a community. The address is www.patreon.com slash pallet. Now, let me spell that if I have just a second. It's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash P-A-L-E-T-T-E, patreon.com slash pallet. And I don't, know if we can, I don't know if we can as far as the address, but that's the easiest way to, to get to – Living proof that these stories are out there. They're continuing as the journey continues. You don't have to wait a year until fi until filming is finished. You can see what we've done already, and you can be a part of this amazing story that I'm getting to experience all over the world, one color at a time. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you said it because I could not duplicate your passion. So I really, I'm glad you did that for us. Um, my name is Maxwell Ivy. People know me as the blind blogger, although as Frederick says, I'm so much more than that these days. And you people can find me at the blind or on Twitter. I'm at Maxwell Ivy. And I am the author of two very good self-help books, uh, leading you out of the darkness into the light, a blind man's inspirational guide to success. And, It's not the cookie, it's the bag, and an easy-to-follow guide to weight loss success. And that's over at theblindblogger.net. And I'm also seeking contributions or participation in my upcoming trip to New York City. And now it's your turn, Frederick, to close us out here. Hey, I just want to say thank you to Michael. Uh, really, you know, please go out and pledge to his Patreon page. He's really doing an awesome thing. And I just want to say thank you, Michael, for your time. And uh, thank you. You know what, man? Much success to you. And we really yeah, thank appreciate you, you, Michael. We really appreciate you staying here, uh, uh, being here. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Thank, thank goodness for what you're doing. It's making a difference. I'm so happy to be a part of it. All right, Michael. Yeah, and, thank you very and much. You were, you were an amazing guest for our first show. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of it. Yeah. And you have an awesome day. <laughs> you're welcome. You too. Cheers. All right. Cheers, thank Michael. You. And I are cheers. Stay, Salud. Max and I are going to stay online. Are going to stay on. We're going to chat a little bit about the interview and say what we chat about what we just learned. Okay, guys. Well, I'm going to bounce. So I think. Uh, yeah. Do you need me for anything else? No, I think we're done. For, 
Okay. Well, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you doing this, and uh, it's a great way to kick off the new show. Yeah. I'm I'm just honored. I I, I really appreciate it, guys. Um, I can't wait to uh, to see how it turns out on Thursday. Yeah. All right. All right. Good, Michael. Take care, man. All right. All right, Take guys. Care. Be good. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Right. All right, Max. Well, I I thought we did good. I thought as as a team we we had a good show. What do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. Now I just want to end this show, the first show. Uh, maybe we could do this as a habit where we just chat about what we just learned. Okay, we could do that. A little. Um... <laughs> two or three minutes. Two or three minutes, and that's it. <laughs> okay. So, what did you learn about this interview, man? How, how did you? What did you learn? How did you? Uh, how did you like it? What did you learn about it from it? I I think it's uh. The, the one thing I learned is that it seems like people who are successful, people who are going after difficult, challenging things, they seem to have quite a few things in common. I mean, they seem to be able to slow down and uh, and focus on what's what's important to them when everything else around them is is chaotic. Uh, they seem to be able to find solutions, ask questions, ask for help. Uh, and they also seem to understand that sometimes you just have to take that time and accept, uh, accept where you are right this minute and take some time to, uh, to get clear on that before you can move forward. But the one thing I really loved, and it's something I'm hearing more and more is you have to remember that you are still you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the most important thing, whether you're whatever, Whether you're you're visually impaired or not, this is what you need to remember. That's so true, so true. Even for people who lost their job, you lose their jobs. You know what I mean? Or people who are they lose a spouse or they they whatever. They're you're still you. Especially for people who have lost a job, because quite quite often these are people who have done the same job for five, ten, twenty years at a time, and when they lose that job, they lose their identity. So there is a, a transformation project process. And that's when, you know, especially people who have lost jobs have to remember that you are still you. Mm-hmm. All right, Max, we're going to wrap this up. Can you remind us where we can where we can find you and uh, where we can where can we buy your books? Okay, uh, I'm at theblindblogger.net, theblindblogger.net on Twitter, which is my current preferred social media hangout, is at Maxwell Ivy. The books are on Amazon, and uh, you can find them on Frederick By's website. Creative as, Magic Store. Uh, yeah, it's the Creative Magic Store. Yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> idea of my books are going to be in somebody else's store. That's always good. That's always a good day. In the um, recommended reading uh, section, folks. In the re- well, cool. I really appreciate that, and that's a that's a great honor. And hopefully, some of our uh, future guests or future show hosts will also have some book projects that they want to uh, to have included in your store up there so we'll we'll see how that how that goes but uh, the blindblogger.net and I'm very, always happy to meet new people make new friends and see where life is going to take me next so don't feel like you have to have a good reason or want to hire me in order to click the contact button and say hey awesome awesome all right Max That's it for us. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you very much for this first show. Ladies and gentlemen, we just want to say bye-bye. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. How did you like it? How did you like it? (laughs) I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody out there and also everybody who contributes to our Patreon page. You are really helpful to this show and we are grateful for your help. In case you're wondering, Patreon is a simple way for you to contribute to the podcast and get super cool exclusive rewards in return. I promise you will love the perks. Our Patreon page is at frederickby.com. That's Frederick with a C buy like bye and click patreon in the header the money is used to cover our production costs and enhancements it is also used to cover our editing time and sharing to different podcast channels you can contribute for as low as one dollar and you can even choose your platform either podbean or patreon.com 
See ya next time.